June 2016, the UK decided to leave the European Union. But two years on, amid acrimonious last-minute political rows on the exact terms of Britain's departure, disturbing questions have surfaced about the legitimacy of the referendum that began it all. We asked veteran investigative journalist Paul Lashmar to find out why. October 2018, hundreds of thousands of protesters marched through central London. One of the biggest demonstrations seen in the UK in years, aimed at getting a second chance to rethink Britain's proposed exit from the European Union. The only way that politicians can cover their own behind is by giving us a people's vote so that we can actually decide as a people what to do next. A lot of us think that remaining is a much better idea and trying to reform the European Union, make that better, rather than running and hiding. We're Brits. Brits don't quit. Britain's Prime Minister might say the same thing, but for Theresa May, not quitting has meant staying faithful to the small majority that voted to leave the EU two years ago, whatever the cost. Yet, what if that vote was tainted? What if, instead of being a free and fair reflection of the people's will, the Brexit referendum was one of the biggest frauds ever perpetrated on British democracy? In any other election, if fraud of this level had been uncovered, then we have the legislation that puts aside the results and we have the election again. As the deadline for Britain's exit from the EU draws near, there are still too many troubling questions about the vote that got Brexit underway, about its fairness and its legitimacy, about who was behind it, who paid for it, and the motives of many of those involved. My name is Dr Paul Lashmar. I'm an author and deputy head of journalism at City University of London. Brexit is a watershed moment for the UK. Like everyone else, my students will be directly affected. And look at the mess they've got themselves. It could be one of the most important political events of their lives. So I've been looking for answers. What I've heard is a story so complex and murky, it almost defies belief. It all began in 2013. To placate a wing of his party that had long been antagonistic to the EU, Prime Minister David Cameron was taking the biggest gamble of his career. We will give the British people a referendum with a very simple in or out choice. Like all ballots in the UK, the referendum was to be overseen by the Electoral Commission. Though anyone could take part in the public debate, the Commission designated two official campaign bodies, one in favour of remaining in the EU, one for leaving, and gave each a fixed spending limit of £7 million. Only British registered donors were allowed to contribute to those campaigns. David Cameron became the public face of the pro-EU campaign. We are better off, we are safer in a reformed European Union. Vote Leave was fronted by the PM's cabinet colleagues, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. I think we should take the chance now, as a country, to take back control. The pro-Brexit side had the backing of another unofficial campaign, Leave EU. Its most prominent figure was Nigel Farage of the UK Independence Party. But Cameron's plan backfired. Against all the odds, the UK opted for the exit. The UK has voted to leave the European Union. Yeah! Let June the 23rd go down in our history as our Independence Day! The shock on the Remain side was profound. Their early hopes of an easy victory dashed. 
How had it gone so horribly wrong? As the post-mortems got underway, attention began focusing on the role played by social media, a powerful tool for swaying public opinion. To find out more, I went to see one of my university colleagues. We've been looking at the Brexit debate for a very long time. Dr. Marco Bastos is a specialist in communications. So this is what we call a network graph or a plot, if you will. It's he showed me a graph of Twitter activity during the referendum. Strange patterns Brexit. emerged. We noticed a drop in the uh, uh, number of users that we were monitoring. Uh, it was a significant drop. I hadn't seen anything that big up to that point. And uh, it turned out that, that they had very much, very much so uh, uh, bot-like features. Bots are computer-generated accounts programmed to automatically push certain messages online. What's happening here is that this bot is retweeting a range of real-world users. So this is a single message in all likelihood that was retweeted several times by uh, this very same bot. Marco explained that while bots were used by the Remain campaign, it was the Leave side that made the most of them. There were more bots towards the Leave side of the campaign, for sure. Uh, the, the signal was, was quite clear. Some of my colleagues have looked into similar data and they have uh, come to the conclusion that uh, these accounts were, at least a, a portion of them, were operated by the Internet Research Agency in Russia. Based in St. Petersburg, the Internet Research Agency, or IRA, is a troll farm, an organization created expressly to sow discord and disinformation on the web. It was identified by American intelligence as having played a key role in manipulating the 2016 election of President Donald Trump. Though no one knew it at the time, it now seems that the IRA also played a role in Brexit. On the day of the referendum, we found a marked change in behaviour. So accounts that had been intermittently tweeting on Brexit suddenly started tweeting a lot. Edinburgh University researcher Dr Claire Llewellyn has examined millions of tweets that were posted prior to the referendum. Many of them, it turns out, from the same suspect internet research agency accounts. So the tweets all followed the same format, which was a lot of hashtags and then a URL. And they were using that to promote a trending topic so that a lot of people saw that information and therefore they were trying to affect Brexit using that strategy. So what we have here is trolls, so it's human people writing tweets. What they flipped to was being bots. True scale of the Russian Twitter activity on Brexit only came to light by accident because the company passed the data to a US congressional investigation into the Trump election. In that probe, another key social media player, Facebook, was already playing a starring role. Mr Zuckerberg, what is Facebook doing to prevent foreign actors from interfering in U.S. elections. Uh, one of my greatest regrets in running the company is that we were slow in identifying the Russian information operations in 2016. And that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake. And I'm sorry. What no one yet fully understands is the role that Facebook may have also played in Brexit. The company says it has found almost no evidence of Russian interference and repeated that claim in a statement to this programme. But researchers are sceptical. But Facebook is basically a black box, so we don't really know what's going on inside Facebook. And that's not just Facebook, that's also Instagram, WhatsApp and a number of other uh, platforms operated by Facebook. The fact that doubts persist is due in part to the company's connection to another murky affair. In early 2018, the Guardian newspaper revealed that 87 million personal Facebook accounts had been illegally harvested by a UK-based strategic communications business. Called Cambridge Analytica, it worked with the Trump presidential campaign and had ties to leave EU. An offshoot of a larger company called SCL, which had an alleged background in military disinformation, Cambridge Analytica's promise was that it could target people with messages to modify their voting choices. So, for a highly neurotic and conscientious audience, you're going to need a message that is rational and fear-based or emotionally based. The Cambridge Analytica scandal would eventually wipe almost $120 billion off the Facebook's market value and raise serious questions about the vulnerability of Western democracies to manipulation. To find out more, 
I went to meet the journalists behind The Guardian's Cambridge Analytica scoop. Carol Cadwallader told me how she first began to pull the threads together. It started when, in order to confirm the data company's links to leave UU, she contacted the campaign group's spokesman, Andy Wigmore. Andy wrote back and he said, happy to clarify, Cambridge Analytica did do work for us, but we never paid them. They were happy to do it for free. And I was like, hmm, there's definitely something interesting here. So because this looks like a donation to me and donations need to be declared. Trump and Farage in front of the golden lift. Andy's the person who took that photo and, and the photo of them all, he's in one as well, the bad boys of Brexit. And Brexit, he said, was like a Petri dish for the Trump campaign. You know, it was like a test case. Carol's revelations led to the biggest data protection investigation ever held on both sides of the Atlantic. We started that conversation with Mr. Zuckerberg. Cambridge Analytica sought to identify mental vulnerabilities in voters and worked to exploit them by targeting information designed to activate some of the worst characteristics in people, such as neuroticism, paranoia and racial biases. Chris Wiley, a former director of Cambridge Analytica turned whistleblower, gave evidence to the US Senate and a British parliamentary committee that began taking an interest in the Brexit referendum and fake news. It's clicking on the ad and then performing an action. So that's what the definition of a conversion is. So, so filling out a saying that had uh, these institutions not cheated, in your words, then the outcome of the referendum might have been different. I think it is completely reasonable to say that there could have been a different outcome in the referendum, you know, had there not been, in my view, cheating. There needs to be a deeper investigation of the uh, of fake accounts, you know, gr Facebook groups being used to propagate information. Conservative MP Damien Collins is the chairman of the British Parliamentary Committee. We've had evidence from Facebook, but we feel that we should hear from Mark Zuckerberg because he, by his own admission, he's the person that decides what happens at Facebook. There are still big concerns that Facebook have not done enough to investigate the role of fake accounts. They've not been transparent on the issue of data breaches and user data ending up in the hands of people who shouldn't have it. Fake accounts, Russian trolls, data mining. Complicated stuff, and none of it doing much to quell my fears that there was something unpleasant lurking in the Brexit undergrowth. But I barely scratched the surface. Next up was another whistleblower, this time someone who'd worked for the official Vote Leave campaign. I was working with the, some of the top advisors in the country, you know, constantly seeing Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, you know, some of the most influential politicians in Britain. Recent graduate Shamir Sani joined Vote Leave in early 2016 and was asked to engage with ethnic minorities. Vote Leave understood that they couldn't just win on white votes. They understood that they couldn't win on, like, people that hate immigrants. My generation he was tasked with working with one of the official campaign's outreach group called Believe. It was led by a young fashion student. I met Darren Grimes in the first week that I joined. Um, it was one of, the, one of the few outreach groups that was very focused on a liberal, progressive message. But Sani says he later realised the official Vote Leave campaign had another purpose in mind for their young volunteers, to circumvent the legally binding Electoral Commission spending limits. Vote Leave understood that they had a spending cap. So they needed to find a way, effectively, to breach that spending cap. Sani was told that Vote Leave had found a way of getting the Be Leave outreach group some new campaign money, but there were strings attached. Effectively, Vote Leave advised us to create ourselves into a separate campaign group so that they could give us almost £700,000 to spend. But they gave it on a condition. They gave it on a condition saying the only way that they can give it to us is if we give it to AIQ, which was a digital company working at Vote Leave. AIQ, or Aggregate IQ as it's sometimes known, is a Canadian-based data business. It had worked on US presidential primaries in 2015 with SCL elections. Cambridge Analytica's parent company. Literally a week before a uh, referendum date, we were spending hundreds of thousands of pounds a day on AIQ. Yep, a day. The money was sent directly from Vote Leave to AIQ. It never touched Believe bank accounts. 
um, because we didn't even have a bank ready by then. Sani's disquiet at these events later turned him into a whistleblower. He passed his evidence to the Electoral Commission and in July 2018, they fined vote leave £61,000 for, among other things, breaching the spending rules. The founder of Believe, Darren Grimes, was fined £20,000. He is now appealing that decision. But there's other stories involving strange sums of campaign funding that haven't yet been as adequately explained. Belfast, Northern Ireland, one of the poorest parts of the UK, which has benefited the most from EU investment. For many here, there's long been concern that Brexit's effects on cross-border relations with the Irish Republic could mean a return to the dark days of the Troubles. So when a small local political party received a £435,000 donation for the Brexit campaign, the largest in the party's history, eyebrows were raised. Why was a Northern Irish political party being so involved you know, in, in the referendum in, in Great Britain, in England and in Scotland? Back in 2016, investigative journalist Peter Geegan was shocked when he saw a pro-leave advertisement in a local English newspaper. The ad was sponsored by Ulster's Democratic Unionist Party, the DUP. For them is a huge sum of money. They're spending it on a, on a piece of material that's not going to circulate in Northern, in, in Northern Ireland at all, at all. The single advertisement cost the DUP £282,000, almost five times as much as they had spent on their participation in the UK's general election the previous year but no one knew from where the money had come to pay for it. Northern Ireland had these unusual laws. Uh, there was secrecy of political donations. So in Northern Ireland, you didn't reveal the names of political donors. And the reason for this was kind of a hangover from the troubles, the violence in Northern Ireland. The loophole was used by the DUP's shadowy benefactor to hide their identity. Finally, after intense media pressure, the DUP revealed the money had come from a body called the Constitutional Research Council, or CRC. But exactly who or what lies behind the CRC remains to be seen. Do you know where the Constitutional Research Council gets its money from? Uh, you'd have to ask the Constitutional Research Council. So you're Council. saying you don't know where they got the money from? Uh, I, I believe that they have raised their money legitimately, and uh, we were delighted to receive the donation from them. You uh, say I'm you delighted. believe they raised it legitimately, you have to know that legally. Yeah, and um, we do. You, you um, know that, and so, and so, and so are and you refusing to tell people? If the Constitutional people? Research Council want to publish where they do their fundraising, that is a matter for them, not for the DUP. The Constitutional Research Council is a jargony term. It's called an unincorporated association. It means they don't have to file company accounts, they don't have to have an address. And because of the donor secrecy laws in Northern Ireland, we don't, they don't have to tell us who they are, they don't have to tell us um, where they got the money from. Um, but the Democratic Unionist Party is supposed to be completely sure that it has checked out where this money came from and that the money is legitimate. We also asked the DUP what due diligence it had done on the true source of the money. A spokesperson told us... The Electoral Commission has raised no issues in relation to the DUP campaign, including the donation which came from a permissible donor, who in turn are themselves regulated by the Electoral Commission. Interestingly, the DUP spent another slice of the mysterious donation on the services of Agrica IQ, same data company to which Vote Leave sent money when illegally circumventing the UK's strict referendum spending laws. The DUP did not declare that they were working with anybody, they said that they were working purely on their own, yet they spent money with the exact same companies that Vote Leave spent money with. Despite these curious circumstances, the UK's Electoral Commission has said that it does not have sufficient grounds to open an investigation. The DUP had broken the law, it had committed a criminal offence. QC Joe Morn is a director of the Good Law Project, a body now challenging the Commission's decision not to investigate. The law is very, very clear. To protect um, our democracy from foreign interference, those who accept donations have a clear, positive obligation to look at and to understand who is giving them money. So it's the vote leave story all over again. Since the Brexit referendum, questions about the mysterious donors and the so-called dark money have continued to surface. 
Journalist Peter Jukes focused his attention on the biggest political donor in UK's history, insurance mogul Aaron Banks. Allegedly, he transferred more than £8 million in loans and donations to leave EU and other Brexit campaigns. There have been various questions about how Aaron Banks could, could afford this because there's no visible means of support. He's not a wealthy man. He has a big house, but he has a £500,000 mortgage on it, but somehow donated £9 million at least to leaving the EU. Whenever questioned, Banks has been evasive about the true source of his wealth. His reticence troubles MP Damien Collins, chairman of the British Parliamentary Select Committee investigating disinformation and fake news. The reason these questions around Aaron Banks' money persist is we keep being told different stories. We keep being told, well, he sold this business and the, the money came from that, that sale, but it turns out there was no real profit made on that sale or it came from these mines or it came from somewhere else. And it, none of it makes sense. But what really concerns investigators are the multiple meetings Mr Banks is known to have held with Russian officials in London in the months running up to the referendum. Why would he be meeting in the run up to Brexit? So many meetings. I mean, it turned out, if you're talking about Levy EU officials and Russian you know, embassy staff, 11 or 12 meetings in the run up to Brexit. Why on earth, why were the Russians dangling lucrative offers to British businessmen uh, bankrolling Brexit? You have to ask the question did foreign money make it into the Brexit campaign? In June 2018, Aaron Banks and his business partner, Andy Wigmore, appeared before a parliamentary committee, but he left before the MPs were able to fully question him. He's misled Parliament and the public, um, not only about uh, his own financial activities, but also uh, the frequency of his contacts with the Russian embassy here uh, in London. In November 2018, the Electoral Commission referred Aaron Banks to the National Crime Agency on suspicion that various criminal offences may have been committed. Banks declined to answer our questions, but he has consistently denied receiving money from Russia and dismisses other claims as ludicrous. The case is ongoing, but former government minister Ben Bradshaw believes a full inquiry into the referendum is long overdue. He wants an investigation similar to the Mueller probe into alleged collusion between Russia and the Trump presidential campaign. Because it's very embarrassing for our government, for our intelligence services, to look flat-footed like this and to leave it to an American political uh, and congressional uh, process to reveal the truth about what happened in Britain. Over in Brussels, de facto capital of the union Brexiteers want to leave, many think the truth is already out there. I went to meet Sajid Karim, a leading UK Conservative member of the European Parliament. He lays responsibility for the Brexit mess squarely at the feet of Russian President Vladimir Putin. A weakening of the European Union is in his interests. It is his aim, it is his goal. And I'm afraid we are on the verge of um, delivering that for him today. I don't think Brits and certainly many of the Europeans have actually understood to what extent their lives are about to change unless our governments, including my government in the United Kingdom, take the step of investigating and protecting our democracy today. It wasn't the only warning about Russian meddling I heard in Brussels. Russia is responsible for 80% of disinformation activities in Europe. 80%. At a European and Commission this, conference this on electoral interference, interference, former NATO Secretary and General Anders Rasmussen was giving a stark warning of the threat Europe faces. Over the past two years, foreign interference has been detected in at least 10 elections and referendums on both sides of the Atlantic. And finally... Brexit, Rasmussen says, was surely one of Russia's targets. I have no doubt, and I think we have evidence, that they interfered. So I think the lesson learned is that we should focus on preventing this from happening in the future. Back in Britain, the endless political row over Brexit was rolling on, but always about how to implement it 
rather than the legitimacy of the referendum that got it going. Order. Things were supposed to come to a head this month with a final parliamentary vote on the terms of the UK's exodus. The Instead, the uncertainty and instability continued. I began this film with questions about the Brexit referendum that urgently needed answers. What I've heard has only increased those concerns. Yet, as Britain's departure from the EU draws ever closer, I'm left with one chilling thought. Were we here in Britain duped into making one of the worst political decisions in our history? If you win a campaign or a referendum or an election based on breaking the law, then it isn't democratic. It's a lie, it's a scam, it's a cheat.